Hello ladies and gentlemen of the internet, my name is John and today we're talking about firepower threat defense in GNS3. This video will have less to do with GNS3 than the previous video. I wanted to do kind of a shorter video just on how I structure rules, uh, access control policies within firepower and share my insights in that. Um, everybody has their own approaches to building access control policies, but I'll show you the way that I do it and how I like to do it. And also you'll notice I, I changed the lab up a little bit. It's a single firewall now, not uh, an HA pair. And uh, I got some new custom icons also. I will make sure to share those in the blog post so people can download them because I know inevitably somebody will ask. So let's jump into it. Let me move some of this stuff around. Okay, so let me get logged into Firepower here. You can ignore the screen tearing. And periodically you'll see that I kind of cut forward in the video, do some editing magic to speed this stuff up. It, all, it is all running um, as KVM VMs, and for that reason, it can run a little bit slow at times. So in the last video, we had just a the most basic access control policy imaginable. And you can ignore the naming here, but the function from the last video is exactly the same. In that it's not, the firewall isn't acting like a firewall in any traditional sense right now. We just have it um, in network discovery mode. Um, and it's essentially meaning that it's going to behave more like a router. We're not filtering traffic. Um, it's just forwarding packets. And we're not logging any traffic either. That's why on that main summary pa page that we logged into, you didn't see anything being reported. And that's based on this default action right here that's set to network discovery. Um, and then you can see we have our policy assignment here that we're assigning this access control policy to this firewall, FTD v1. So the first thing that I like to do is build out some categories. Um, a lot of people want to jump in and just start doing their access control entries to permit certain flows. Uh, the reason I don't like doing that is in Firepower Threat Defense, as previously mentioned in the first video, I believe, um, there, isn't a, there isn't a per interface access control list anymore. This is uh, essentially being applied as a global policy, so all of your access control entries fall into one access list. And even looking at it through the GUI here, uh, it can be kind of an administrative nightmare whenever you want to come in and add new rules or troubleshoot why certain rules aren't working. So for that purpose, I like to build categories out that mimic um, the naming of per interface access control lists that you'd see in ASA. You could name your categories um, however you wanted to, and you could have your categories set up to encapsulate certain traffic any way that you want to to organize the access control policy. But again, I, I do it just for sake of organization um, to lower administrative overhead in the future. So with that said, let's create our first category. And I'm going to keep all of these categories that are based on um, ingress, egress zones. I'm going to keep them all in the uh, default part of the access control policy. I tend to use mandatory for more global blocks, stuff that's going to impact everything that transits the firewall as opposed to a specific flow. So the first one I'll make is a category called inside access in. And then I'll click up here to create another category. It defaults to wanting to insert that category into mandatory, but I'm going to keep them in default, just my own personal preference. We'll call this one outside access in. For sake of demonstration, I also created a DMZ before starting this video, so I'll create another category that is DMZ access in, and then change it to insert that category into default. So inside my inside access in, I'm going to set up a pretty traditional rule. Since we don't have uh, security zones like we do in ASA, everything has to be explicit. So I'm going to say that if the traffic is sourced from our inside routed zone, going to any other zone, I want to permit that traffic. And I'll give that rule a name like inside to any. I'm going to enable logging on this rule. 
And you don't have to do this for every single rule. I think that it's good to do it when you're setting your rules up. That way you, you can troubleshoot and make sure that traffic is going the way that you want it to, being permitted or dropped as you would expect. Uh, when logging's turned off, you don't get anything triggered in your event log. So that's why I enable logging on every single rule. You could prune this back if you want it to uh, after everything was tested and working successfully. So, and again, I'm not specifying a destination zone because I want my inside zone to be able to go to both outside and DMZ. So then I'll press OK. Then under my ax outside access in, I do have one rule that I want to allow. So when traffic is being sourced from the outside routed zone, going to the inside routed zone, I have a network object from my domain controller already created. At least I think I do should be 10.0.10.10. .10. Guess I don't. Let me create that really quick. And we'll say this is lab domain controller. Obviously, this is a terrible idea to forward traffic from the internet to your domain controller, no matter what the port is. But um, I'm doing this just as a demonstration, so we have a rule populated in here. So I'll say, <clears throat> again, if the zone is outside, going to inside. The destination network is my lab domain controller. And then under ports, I'll say if it's TCP on 3389, allow remote desktop. And then again, under my logging, I'll log at the beginning and end of the connection. So we'll say RDP to domain controller. I will just call it RDP to DC will be the name of the rule. And then we're going to make sure that it's in the category outside access in. And then finally, I'll create a rule that allows the DMZ just to get out to the internet. And that'll be DMZ to outside. And that's for traffic sourced from the DMZ zone going to the outside routed zone. You, can, you could specify the networks if you wanted to, and I'll do that, but you don't have to since we're filtering it by the security zones. But this should be 10.0.99.0. It's my DMZ subnet, I'll add that. Then under logging, we'll log at beginning and, and end of the connection. And then finally, for my default action now, I don't want it to be network discovery. If traffic isn't matched by one of these rules, I want to block it. So we'll switch that to access control, block all traffic. And then there's a little piece of paper off to the far right here. Click on that, and then we can enable logging at the beginning of the connection. Since it's a block action, there is no logging at end of connection. And then we'll click OK. And then that's it for setting up some basic firewall rules. Um, if you wanted to, you'll notice that for each of these rules, you could enable an IPS policy, you could enable a file policy, that's your AMP, um, safe search, etc. cetera. Um, but right now we're not doing that. This is like traditional sort of ASA rules where we're permitted and denying traffic through our stateful firewall. So I'll click on save. And then I'll deploy that. And then while it's deploying, I'll show you really quick how to set up some basic, basic IPS rules and then how you would apply those to each of your access control entries. So under intrusion, this is going policies, access control, intrusion. I'm going to create a new policy. I'll leave the default action to drop when in line. If you wanted to just test your IPS rules out, you could uncheck that box so that IPS wasn't dropping traffic, but I'm going to leave it checked. I'm going to base this off the balanced security and connectivity policy, but you can have multiple IPS policies assigned to multiple firewall rules. So you could have more than one if you wanted to do security over connectivity or no rules active, maximum detection, etc. But I'm going to do this just again based off balanced security and connectivity, and we'll call it lab IPS1. And then you have the option to create the policy or create and edit the policy. We'll do create and edit really quick. I'm not actually going to change anything, but I want to show um, just how you can look into these IPS signatures and where some more important information is gleaned. 
All right, so if we go into our rules that are set to drop and generate events, we can open up any of these rules in particular. We'll kind of show what I want to demonstrate really quick. So you'll have this show details button after you click on one. And I'm going to click on show details. And then if you come down to the documentation section under the rule, you'll see that the rules de defined by these variables, dollar sign external underscore net to dollar sign SMTP servers. This is really important because if you don't know where these variables are defined, it makes it really hard for you to make sure your signatures are going to fire correctly. And the out of the box defaults for this just aren't very good. So to change those variables, you want to go to objects, object management. Then under objects, object management, you want to come to variable sets. Again, just like your IPS policies, you can have multiple variable sets. And I will show you momentarily where you tie those IPS rules or IPS policies and variable sets in. But we have just the variable set here, the default variable set. And I've already modified this, but I want to show you what's important to modify. By default, home and external net aren't defined as anything. Um, so what I do is under home net, click edit here, I add in all of my internal subnets, including my DMZ ones, into the included networks. And then you'll see that it would show up under customized variables. And then under external net, I say that external net is anything that's not defined inside of the home underscore net variable. And that'll help so your IPS signatures actually fire properly. And then you can come through and tweak this and set up additional variable sets based on specific flows. So you might have a variable set just for traffic coming from the DMZ to the outside or, and vice versa, and variable sets defined specifically for your in inside zones. But I'm just using one variable set, and that's the default variable set. And then where you apply this, just like all of your sub access control entries here, intrusion, malware, identity, SSL, these are all tied together with your access control policy. So if we go back into my uh, test access control policy here, you'll see that to actually tie my access control or tie my intrusion prevention policies, um, and apply them to anything, I can either click on this shield, that's uh, intrusion policy, currently set to none, or I can click on edit. I'll do it both ways. So for my inside to any rule, I'll click on edit, and then I'll click on my inspection tab. I'll say the policy that I want to use is this lab IPS1, and then I'll use my default variable set. Again, if I had multiple ones, I could define multiple ones. And then I'll click on save. And you'll see this shield now turns yellow. For my outside access in, this is the remote desktop to domain controller rule. I'm not going to enable an IPS policy. And then for my DMZ to outside, I'll click on the shield. That takes me straight to the inspection tab for that rule. And then for this one, I'm going to do security over connectivity, just to show that you can have different IPS policies defined for each rule. Which brings up a fine point. If you find that your IPS is too aggressive or you don't want to apply any IPS rules to a specific flow, you can set up a separate access control entry, a separate rule, and then in that rule make sure that no IPS is defined. And then another quick note on this is just like traditional access lists in ASA, this is processed top down. So if you add any rules to mandatory or inside a default above these rules, they'll get processed before the rules below them. So then now I have my two IPS policies, this one being the custom one that I set up, that's the lab IPS one, this one's security over connectivity, both using the default variable set. Then I'll click save. And that's all I'm going to demonstrate in this video, just for sake of brevity. In the next video, I want to cover how we set up an identity policy so that we can have rules based on Active Directory group membership. And I'll also talk a little bit about how we can set up our advanced malware protection or our file policies. You'll find that those are defined exactly like our IPS rules are. So that's all for this video, guys. I'll catch you next time, and I hope this was informative for you.